Post journalism. Does democracy have room for both governance by the many and by the so-called best and the brightest? Tonight, as part of our joint initiative with TVO and the Toronto Star, we're asking whether elites are inherently undemocratic. First up, though, writer Frederick de Boer explains why he thinks education reform that recognizes differences in individual aptitudes could be a starting point for more equitable societies. It's Thursday, May 27th, and that's next on the Democracy Agenda. Equal opportunity that underpins the promise of democratic nations begins with access to a decent education. But that's not what's happening, according to writer Frederick de Boer. His new book is called The Cult of Smart, How Our Broken Education System Perpetuates Social Injustice. And Frederick de Boer joins us now from Brooklyn, New York, to explain. It's great to meet you. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing, Steve? Just great. Thank you so much. I want to start with an excerpt from your book, and then we'll chat. This book is my prayer you write for the untalented, an attempt to show how badly our society and its people are hurt by the obsessive focus on schooling and smarts. We can build a better future, but only if we are willing to think clearly and speak frankly about who succeeds in the current system and why. Okay, let's start there. And let's be clear about what you're saying and perhaps what you're not saying here, more importantly. Are you saying that we shouldn't be encouraging people to go as far in their educational lives as they possibly can? No, I think that people should pursue education. What I think that we need to do is we need to diversify or really re-diversify um, what it means to be an educated person and the type of things that we are teaching uh, in, in K through 12 schools and colleges and other uh, contexts. Uh, I think that it's really important to understand that there has in the last 30 or so years, uh, particularly in America, but in other places like Canada, there's been a, um, <clears throat> a transformation in how we define success in schools. So now we see the uh, uh, educational outcomes and educational like, excellence in quantitative terms, right? The obsession in the American educational policy world is GPAs, SAT scores, state standardized test scores, graduation rates, right? It's all numbers. This is actually a very new phenomenon. If you go back to 1970, in many places in the United States, parents would receive almost no quantitative information about how their student is doing in school. Uh, they would get report cards, and this, the students would get grades in those uh, in their classes, A, B, C, D, F, um, and they probably care about those grades. But in many contexts, they wouldn't even be reporting an overall GPA. They wouldn't be averaging the GPA up. Uh, in many contexts, these students would be taking no state standardized tests um, or very minimal testing. Uh, the, at, this, at this point, the participation rate in the SAT in many states was very low, I mean, often less than 10%. Um, the class rank was often not computed in, at this time. Uh, there were not states giving schools or school districts report cards, as often happens in American education now. So there was just a great deal less of quantitative information to say that, uh, <clears throat> you know, this student is doing well, this school, this district is doing well. And, uh, that change has, in my opinion, uh, come with it a, a narrowing down of what we mean of what we mean when we say, you know, an effective student, a quality student, an excellent student. That before everything came became uh, reduced to numbers, that there was a sense in which there were values that we were trying to uh, spread in our schools that were not quantitative in measure. Things like patience, kindness, sociability, creativity, etc. Um, I think that the obsession with numbers has created a situation in which we no longer respect the diversity of ways that students can be excellent. Hmm. Well, maybe this is a good time for that anecdote that I read in your book. This goes back to a time when you were teaching in public schools. You're trying to teach a kid long division, and he just couldn't mm -hmm. get the hang of it. Um, mm -hmm. Seemed like the end of the world for him. I just can't get it, he said. What's the kind of newer, better approach that you think we ought to have been taking as opposed to how we might traditionally handle that situation? Sure. So the, the, the answer is not this kid should not be taught long division. That's not the point, right? The point is, is that right now um, and increasingly uh, with more, due to more and more policies to this effect, um, we have a narrow uh, set of criteria for, through which uh, students can pass 
um, from one grade to the next, or they can earn their diploma. And this is particularly true in high school. So high school, especially with the adoption of the Common Core Standards, has seen more and more strict rules about what it takes to be able to advance through the system. Um, and so you take this kid who's struggling in long division. Uh, right now, in many K through 12 contexts, he'll have the ability to pass to the next grade and to continue to develop those skills as he ages up. But if you get to high school, you have a lot of kids who, for example, can't pass their algebra requirement. And if they don't pass their algebra requirement, they cannot move to the next level in school. So uh, this is a problem just theoretically, but it's also a problem because we look at, for example, there are states such as Arizona where it has happened in the past where something like 65% of their students are failing to meet their math requirements, 65%. And so you have this major stopgap that's keeping people from advancing in their careers. It's also a problem because we know that an inability to pass to the next grade is a major driver of dropouts. Because if you are someone, if you're a typical 16-year-old, and you grew up with a cohort of kids and you moved through school with them. And then all of a sudden, you are now being left behind and you have to uh, spend all of your time with kids who are, are a year uh, younger than you. Um, that, that is in many ways destabilizing and insulting and degrading. And so it's not surprising that a lot of kids drop out in that scenario. What I'm advocating for is not that we say, oh, this, this kid can't do math, let's give up. But I am saying that if we loosen these standards, if we give students a, a bigger set of options for how they can progress, we'll be acknowledging the fact that different students have different strengths, and we'll be expressing to all of our young people, hey, look, there's lots of ways to be a useful person, to be a valuable person. So a good example is if you can't pass your, your, your algebra requirement, your algebra 2 requirement, which is a really big one. Or in college, often it's organic chemistry is another big filter class, they call them, um, or weed out class. Um, how about we provide uh, alternatives that uh, test some of the same skills, but that are more flexible for different kind of learners. So instead of having to pass Algebra 2, maybe you can pass a quantitative reasoning class. And that's the kind of class where you learn introductory statistics, you learn to think through problems with numbers, you look at real world scenarios, um, and that way is, you're still teaching math skills and you're still preparing someone from a world in which they want to be numerate, but where you're broadening the options available to everyone. And I think that's particularly true because the simple fact of the matter is uh, many, many people don't use abstract math in their day-to-day -day life ever. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense to make that a strict requirement for graduating from high school um, because you're hurting a lot of lives. And I don't really particularly see what the educational uh, advantage of doing that is. No, I take your point, but I, I, I think I may have taken a, a different lesson from that kid who couldn't do algebra as well, which which speaks to, a, I think, a bigger point that you're trying to make in your book. And it's a difficult point. It's a it's a point that is fraught with mind. Well, in fact, I'll read the quote. This is what you say. Um, the kid who couldn't do long division, he just didn't apparently have the natural aptitude to do the long division. And you say to talk frankly about natural academic talent is to wander into a minefield. So tell us about what some of those minds in that field you're referring to are. You know, I think that if you talk to parents of multiple children, probably the big minefield is which kid is your favorite. But the second biggest one is, you know, who's your smarter kid? And I think that even a lot of parents who obviously love their children equally and want to see them in the best light, I think a lot of parents will quietly acknowledge that maybe one of their kids is a little bit more talented than the other, right? That, they're, that they pick things up quicker, that they have more natural aptitude. The minefield stems from the fact that if you – acknowledge those things, you can certainly take them in a really ugly direction, right? So you can imagine sort of taking, you know, an incoming group of like say third graders and you test them and you say, okay, these kids at the, at the bottom are never going to be uh, academic stars. So let's use less resources on them. Let's just warehouse them. Let's not give them high quality teaching. Let's not give them access to a lot of the resources that we, that we use for education. Obviously, I think that's really ugly. However, we should acknowledge that taking those same kids who struggle academically and expecting them to meet the same standards that the most talented kids do is just as cruel, right? And it's also a waste of resources and it's a waste of teacher attention and time when instead what we can do is we can value those kids just as much. But we can set them with different kinds of benchmarks and metrics and tasks that play to their strengths rather than to their weaknesses. Again, I, you know. I think it's a classic example 
um, you know, of uh, education right now is like the man who only owns a hammer. And so he sees a world full of nails around him, right? When you only have that one tool, when your only tool are these standardized test scores and similar, then all you see is a world full of, you know, ways to measure stu students by the same criteria. But if we were to be more humanistic and we were to broaden and say, you know what, like, yes, it's a valuable skill to be good at math, but it's also the valuable skill to be someone who makes friends easily or to be someone who uh, can be patient when they need to be, someone who can think creatively or someone who can, uh, who can think critically. All these things are things that we can value. And if we can generate ways inside of our schools to value them, just like we value the ability to do algebra, for example, um, then I think that we create not just a more humane uh, system for our students, but a more efficient system for our schools and our teachers as well. Uh, Frederick, I want to get back to this parent-child thing, because I know you use the example in your book of uh, LeBron James, who's a phenomenal basketball player, and therefore we are not surprised that his son is a pretty good basketball player as well. I'm in Canada. I'm going to use hockey for an example. Bobby Hull was a great player. We shouldn't be shocked that Brett Hull was similarly a fantastic player. Gordy Howe's in the Hall of Fame. Are we shocked that Mark Hall, Mark Howe, his son, is also in the Hall of Fame? No, I don't think we are. The notion of educational achievement being something you'd inherit from your parents, though, is something, well, it's somewhat threatening to the whole educational system as it currently exists in North America. Yes? Tell us how and why. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, uh, we, we, we have to be careful about speak. We have to be careful, I guess, the degree to which I, I discuss some of the evidence that, that shows that academic ability is uh, genetic in the book. Um, but the degree to which that's true or is not, is not something that I'm going to be able to figure out. It's going to take people who are way smarter than me to figure that out. But uh, we should not foreclose on the possibility that your biological parents um, have a big impact on uh, who you are academically, uh, because uh, we know that genetics influences everything about us as human beings. And I also think it's important to say we're already kind of operating on that assumption anyway. So, you know, we talk a lot, sociologists talk a lot about what they call assortative mating. And assortative mating means that increasingly, as time has gone on more and more often, um, people are sorting into marriages and having children with people who uh, are educationally similar to them. So if you go back 50 years ago, uh, it was much less likely that you were going to, if you were had a college degree, marry and have kids with someone who also had a college degree. As time has gone on, that dynamic has just gotten more and more and more prevalent and powerful over time, which means that um, we are already kind of practicing a system in which we're sorting ourselves as a country into uh, more and more sort of by educational band. And in fact, one of the big stories of the 2020 election is that um, by many metrics, uh, your educational status, whether you have a high school uh, diploma or a college diploma, master's degree, whatever, that this has become a more uh, politically determinative uh, metric about you than your race. Right. So in other words, more and more often now uh, we are seeing that people are grouping themselves by education rather than race. And so we've already got a situation in the United States where we're paying a ton of attention to who, who we are educationally and choosing partners and co-parents on that metric. And so I think one of the things we need to do is speak frankly about that condition and begin to explore what it means um, rather than uh, ignoring it because we find it uncomfortable because it's not going to get any better or things aren't going to get examined if we just pretend like this is a conversation we don't want to have. Well, I do find this fascinating because, you know, for the last half century, we've been telling everybody it's all about merit. You're only going to get anywhere you're going to get in this world if you are meritorious and, and are credentialed and deserve to get there. And now we've got your book. Uh, Michael Sandel was on this program from Harvard not too long ago talking about the tyranny of merit. And I want to make sure I understand that what you're saying, that if our even if our meritocratic systems of education were better at including greater numbers of students from populations that are historically discriminated, that a meritocracy fulfilled would even be more cruel than what we have now? Can you explain well, think, that to me? Yeah, I mean, I think the way, way that I would look at it is this, right? 
Um, we we very uh, uh, righteously, I think, have in recent decades begun the work, although we're far, far from finished, of reducing the impact of racial category on people's life uh, outcomes. And we have done so because we recognize that, uh, you know, the race that you are born into is not under your control and is an arbitrary distinction that uh, is uh, unjust to reward with poverty or, or wealth or whatever. Um, and that's an important uh, uh, advancement that we're sort of stumblingly, slowly making as a as a civilization. Um, the the thing that I I want people to to think through though is, if it is in fact true that there is such a thing as a natural aptitude for school for academics, and thus a natural aptitude for having a white collar job that earns a lot of money, right? If that is in fact something that is innate to you at least partially innate or intrinsic to you, then that having that ability is just as arbitrary as the racial category into which you fall, right? Hmm. If you don't choose it, if you can't control it, if your parents conceive you and then you end up having to live out the consequences of either a lack of talent or having talent, then how can we say that that's any more fair or any more uh, legitimate or just than if we uh, are a racist society in which people's arbitrary racial category also impacts them negatively? Um, the more that we believe that something is innate, the less we can uh, fairly say that you deserve your outcomes based on that factor. And one of the remedies you have for this, and let's put it on the record right here, you, you say it in the book, you are a self-avowed Marxist, and you believe that there are some versions in a communist society that could address the problem of inequality as we've discussed it here today. Maybe you could amplify a bit on that and tell us how you think that would work. Yeah, I mean, I would avoid the term communism because it's very loaded and it's, a, it's historically com complicated. And um, I'm not sure that as, as much as I, I self-identify with the Marxist philosophy, I don't know that communism can be ported into 21st century conditions where things change very deeply, particularly in terms of uh, the knowledge economy. But I do think that a vastly more redistributive system in which um, we are generating a lot of wealth and productivity, and rather than just distributing it based to people based on a market economy, but rather creating a, a deeper sense of shared prosperity in which we are guaranteeing certain minimal living conditions for everyone is a fairer one. Because again, if we think genes matter, if we think things are innate, um, then it becomes really hard to uh, morally justify, for example, someone who was born without a lot of talent for things that are marketable now, um, uh, that person's poverty. You know, once upon a time, being able to carry a big heavy rock around make you a lot of money, right? You know, a couple thousand years ago, if you were the biggest, strongest warrior, you know, you were the guy with the biggest muscles, then that was something that was very marketable. Nowadays, if you're that person and that's your thing, if you're not good at school, if you're not a scientist, if you're not good at computers, but your thing is being big and strong, right? Your most of what you used to be able to do has been replaced by machines. And maybe you go and you become a laborer and you make $12 an hour, right? So, uh, why is it that we would reward that person 2000 years ago with with you know riches and prestige but now that same person is somebody who is going to be on the unemployment line and on food stamps you know how can we say that this person who has the same general level of ability that the the person who happened to be born 2000 years ago he was a hero while the person here is someone who needs to be uh, the beneficiary of the state, you know, the moral justification for that is perfectly fickle, right? This person who lives now is just unlucky enough to be born in a time in which uh, it's not valuable to, to have his characteristics. And I think we should especially think about this because with the rise of artificial intelligence, a lot of the professions right now that are very remunerative, that are very valuable, um, are going to be replaced by machines. Right. So in other words, being a coder, being a programmer right now is a fantastically well-paying position. But there's going to be a time when the code is written by code right? and AI is doing the job that coders do now. So if you're born now, it's lucky to have those skills. Maybe in 150 years, those skills are no longer marketable because computers are doing it anyway. And so we have to think about the fact that, you know, what is rewarded in the economy is fickle and changes over time. And if that's true, then in my opinion, we shouldn't punish people for having to be born with the wrong skills. I take your point, but there's a political follow-up question here that I need some help with. And that is, mm. 
You know, m many of the people that you're talking about right now are not choosing a socialist alternative. Uh, mm -hmm. We heard Donald Trump actually in the last election campaign to talk about how much he loves the uneducated. Uh, if he is supposedly, I guess, the sort of revenge against the smarty pants set, mm -hmm. why are the people that you are purporting to speak for here following him instead of your option? Well, I think you have to look at sort of the distribution of these ideas. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right about who sort of is is voicing these various ideas. But um, again, like the economy is kind of fickle, right? And it changes quickly. And people who thought that they were doing the right thing all of a sudden find out that they're not being rewarded. So here in the United States, we had for a very long time, you know, this idea of like the factory at the edge of town job, right? Where um, you didn't have to have a college degree. You could just have a college diploma. You go to the factory at the edge of town, you would not be rich, but you could get a job where you'd work your 40 hours a, uh, a week and you could own a home, raise a family, own a car, et cetera. Um, that lifestyle has largely died out for a variety of reasons. Big one being automation, right? Uh, we now, we, we manufacture a ton of stuff in the United States, but manufacturing employs a small fraction of the number of people it used to employ because we have robots and machines that do the things that human beings used to do. The people who were employed in those positions are the kind of people uh, who once would have gone to work at the factory at the edge of town job. These tend to be people who are Donald Trump's style supporters. And I think their anger is reflected at the fact that their parents were able to sort of work according to that social contract and have stable, economically secure lives. And many of them can't do that same thing anymore because the economy changed and the economy changed in the economic favor of people like me who have college degrees and who work in a knowledge economy uh, and who live in urban centers like I live in Brooklyn. And so there's a lot of resentment towards the ideas that come out of, uh, out of from people like me. And, and some of it is justified. I think ultimately, you know, uh, I hope that that the dynamic that you're describing, but if it does change, it has to come from a broadening community understanding that there are forces in the economy that change uh, everybody's outcomes that are not under our control. I don't share Andrew Yang's politics. So Andrew Yang, who was the Democratic presidential candidate in, in 2020 and is now a candidate for mayor here in New York. But, um, you know, he does have a vision of the economy where he says, like, look, if you look at the long term trend over time, a fewer and fewer percentage of, of Americans are involved in the formal economy. And that's just that number has gone down, down, down steadily. And so you're creating this class of people who are just totally outside of the formal economy and they don't really have a place in the society. And he's identifying the fact that, you know, there are long term structural changes to how our, our economy works and our deal works that is outside of the control of individuals. And at some point we have to start to think about the fact that um, it, it's sort of assuming that everybody's economic outcomes are uh, under their control, it becomes a very cruel thing. You've given us a lot to think about. And Frederick DeBoer, we appreciate you coming on TVO tonight to talk about The Cult of Smart, your newest book. Take good care and thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Democracy is supposed to be a system that allows everyone a say in how we are governed. But as populists have argued to some effect, that doesn't exactly square with the level of power that they say rests with the educated, influential elites. As part of our ongoing joint initiative between TVO and the Toronto Star, the democracy agenda lets explore whether meritocracy cannot help but be anti-democratic with, in our nation's capital, John Ibbotson, writer at large for the Globe and Mail. In the annex of the provincial capital, Janice Stein, the Bellsburg Professor of Conflict Management and founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at U of T. And in Corso Italia, Kofi Hope, contributing columnist for the Toronto Star and most recently, the CEO of Monumental, a new startup supporting organizations working on an equitable COVID-19 recovery. And it's great to see you three again. I think we should just start by putting on the record here uh, this clip from Michael Sandel. He's the Harvard philosopher. We had him on the program, I guess, a few months back. And here is how he drew the distinction between merit and meritocracy. If I have to go in for a, a heart surgery, I want a very well-qualified surgeon to do the operation. So merit in the sense of... Uh, 
placing people in jobs who are well qualified for them, that's a good thing. But meritocracy is a way of organizing a society and an, and an economy, is a way of allocating rewards and also social recognition. Meritocracy has a dark side. And the dark side is that meritocracy is corrosive of the common good. It generates hubris among the winners and humiliation among those left behind. Because what it says is that where we land reflects what we deserve. Now, that's a Harvard philosopher, one of the most credentialed people in his field, putting that comment on the record. Janice, get us started. Merit, good, meritocracy, bad? Square that circle for us, if you would. I agree with Michael. Uh, that there, First of all, that's a really important distinction he makes between merit and meritocracy. But he's getting at something that is so important, Steve, which is that we overvalue um, some kinds of merit and we undervalue others. And the kind that we overvalue is credential, the kind that we don't value enough, and wow, the pandemic should have taught us this, uh, are all the kinds of work that, for example, our grocery store clerks did, our food manufacturing and processing uh, plant workers did. There's a a large chunk of our society uh, who play a critical role in creating and helping to sustain the common good, we don't pay enough attention to them. And frankly, Michael is getting at something so important in, in, this, uh, in the book that he wrote. And he talked about it. He said, many of these people feel humiliated undervalued. So it's not only the financial rewards that they get or don't get, and in many cases they don't get, it's the way they're regarded and that internal sense uh, that so many have, I'm not respected, I'm not valued by my community. The book you're referring to is called The Tyranny of Merit, and it was a terrific read, I have to say. That's why we had him on the program. Kofi, I wonder if you'd pick up the story there. Do you see existing meritocracy in Canada as a ladder or a barrier to success? Yeah, I think it's increasingly creating barriers for folks, right? And I think we don't have pure meritocracy in the country, but we have it to a degree. But certainly we know, you know, the neighborhood you're born in, um, the color of your skin, kind of if you're an indigenous person, there's so many factors in life that create barriers, even if we use that narrow um, approach to meritocracy of looking at academic success, so much about accidents of birth, who your parents are, you know, the communities you're a part of, influence people's ability to succeed and do well. Um, and we've just done such a tremendous disservice to this country where we spent, certainly for myself, you know, an, a child of the 80s, growing up where we said the really the only way to truly succeed, to truly have value is your economic success. And the only way to do that is through kind of advanced or university education. And so we devalued the trades. We devalued so many parts of the economy. But I don't know what Janice was saying. Not only that, we've devalued care work, right? Work that's traditionally been seen as work that women were engaged in, but whether that's staying at home to raise kids, whether that's caring for an elderly parent, whether that is being a teacher or working in social service field, you know, so much incredible work where people show amazing impact on society, great merit in the effort and intelligence they bring that is totally disvalued in this system that we have. And that creates barriers and it creates great psychological damage to folks. And it also, on the other hand, has a lot of people feeling that they deserve it and they got it, they earned it, and it, it reinforces these cognitive biases that make us less open to social solidarity or redistribution, which we so dearly need in our in equitable society. John, as I get you to weigh on this, uh, let me uh, let me get a little personal with you, because you're a guy who's got one of the great jobs in all of journalism in the country today for a, a fine newspaper. And um, but you're a kid who came up from humble beginnings in Muskoka. And I wonder how you view the role of meritocracy and how it how it either played or didn't in making things possible for you. Yeah, it's true. I mean, we shouldn't make our arguments based on anecdote. Uh, we all know that, but, but it is true. I grew up in, I think, what would be called an aspirational working class environment. Um, and because I was determined to be a writer, I was 
33 before I managed to get past $10,000 a year. Um, the rest of the time was spent working in clerical jobs of one kind or another. But it all worked out. Uh, you're right. I have, I have not one of the best jobs in Canada. I think I have the best job in journalism in Canada uh, as a columnist for the Globe and Mail. But, uh, and I agree with everything that uh, the Janice and Kopi have said, um, especially about the, the dignity of work and the undervaluing. As we've seen, for example, in long-term care, personal support workers, the entire system rests on, uh, on their shoulders and they are overworked and underpaid, very often, almost always women, very often immigrant women. Um, and, um, and the pandemic revealed how badly we undervalue uh, the work they do. That said, every society is, is an ocracy um, of one kind or another. All systems are class-based. All systems have always been class-based throughout all of history. There has always been a nobility, a priesthood, a military class. We've added in modern society, uh, things like the bureaucracy, the cultural industries, academia, and the like. We are never going to inhabit a society that is not class-based. Always and forever, that will be the case. The only question we can ask ourselves is, how permeable are those classes? How easy is it to get from underclass to working class to middle class um, to stinking rich? Uh, and uh, how, how easy is it to lose uh, status if you don't uh, continue to measure up? That I think we can and always should discuss, but we, be, we will be deluding ourselves if we think that we are ever going to live in a society that is not class-based. Well, that dovetails nicely to where I wanted to go with Janice next. And Janice, we really wanted to have you on this program tonight because I, look at how, how many decades have you been ensconced at a major, one of the world's major universities? I mean, it's, uh, well, anyway, <laughs> suffice to say you, you've had a lot of time there and universities are really the locus of this debate because if the idea is to create a system that is fair and equitable and serves the needs of talented young people from across various social strata, the universities and the colleges of this province and country are supposed to help make that happen. Are they, in fact? They're doing, so I think it's really important, Steve, to say we're doing a much better job than they are in the United States, uh, and for two reasons. One, we have a much higher proportion of our young people going to college and universities. It's quite amazing, actually, because the United States has these famous you know, elite institutions, but they have a lower percentage of their young people going. But he, the second reason is much more important. The cost of an education at one of those elite universities in the United States, $75,000. You know, you, we, we could put a different US. number. U.S., whether you count room and board or not. You know, at our universities, it's still $7,000 for an undergraduate tuition with a long summer in which most of our students work. Uh, and secondly, unlike the United States, we don't have legacy admissions. It just doesn't exist in Canada. So two of the worst causes of what Michael Sandel is talking about don't exist in, in Canada. And let me make one other point, and I love to hear what, what Kofi and John have to say about this, because Michael started by saying, when I go in for heart surgery, I really want a well-qualified doctor to do that operation. And yeah, I think all, every one of us would agree with that comment. The issue is not so much that. The issue is, do we recognize diverse kinds of talents today when we admit young people? Do we, does a young person who's just a professional iconoclast and won't toe the, the line and doesn't build up a CV with all the correct things on it. Does that person get in? Uh, SATs, we don't have in Canada in the same way. There are tremendous barriers in the United States. So the problem is not the education, although there are issues there. The problem is what are the admission criteria? How diverse are they? And how do we let um, a less homogeneous group of people, and I don't only mean race and class, I mean thought. Uh, how do we let these people in so that we continue to shake up our society and get original and iconoclastic people uh, to be our future leaders? Let me throw some numbers at John Ibbotson and, and get him to weigh in on this. John, according to The Economist, 
we're going back a long time now, 1967. Two thirds of Britain's civil service came from a quote, high socioeconomic background, two thirds. Today, the figure is 72%, even higher. Meritocracy was meant to go, as you pointed out, was meant to go in hand in hand with social mobility. But do you think the role of social mobility is no longer playing the same role it once did? It is a genuine threat. After the Second World War, we lived, if you lived in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you lived in practically a golden time. Those societies did not suffer the effect of war, but we had all the benefits of the after effects of war. We had um, a, a massive demobilization of the military workforce and the creation of essentially a suburban middle class through the equivalent of the GI Bill through um, free housing or subsidized uh, support for housing, through mass education. We created a generation, my generation, um, of people who were, were broadly well-educated, broadly um, uh, affluent. Uh, and even if you didn't have a university degree, which became much, much easier to acquire for the boomers than it had been for the generations prior, you could make a good living um, in uh, working the line for GM or some other manufacturing company that has um, divided as we move out of the manufacturing economy and into a more quote knowledge based economy in which you have more people who are winners on the side of high skilled high valued uh, occupations and losers um, who are either in a dead end work or marginal work or insecure work or gig economy work. This is producing the populist reaction, the populist backlash that we've seen in the United States that led to Donald Trump, that, that led to Brexit in Britain, that is leading to really horrific nativist, racist policies in parts of, of Eastern Europe, and that we need to watch for and guard against here in Canada. Uh, again, these are phenomena that, that we need to worry about and fight against, but I don't see a solution other than Again, the permeability of, of class systems based on good, solid public education systems uh, and maybe uh, re rejigging the tax system to, to, to increase taxation for the rich um, and, and uh, on, on the rich uh, and other things like that. But it still has to be incremental. It still has to be fine tuning. You can't go about restructuring the society in an attempt to eliminate um, ocracies of one kind or another, because uh, history teaches us more often than not, the cure is worse than the disease. Did I just hear a conservative columnist calling for tax increases? I'm pretty sure I just heard that. I have, I think, long advocated for greater equity uh, in the taxation system, but I would do it through the elimination of tax breaks uh, for things like capital gains uh, and stuff like that. But sure, you, I, I'm a conservative and I believe in market principles and I believe in allowing people to get ahead and and make the best life they can. But if you look at the reality of what is going on on the ground, especially in places like the United States, you have to recognize there is a real threat there and you have to take concrete pragmatic actions, not bound by ideology of the left or the right in trying to solve them. Good for you, John. Uh, Kofi, I wanna bring you back in here because you're the one millennial among us right now. You're in your high thirties. Uh, I would like to ask you that among the millennials that you know, that you work with, have they been left, have they been lifted out of, say, lower income situations uh, to get to higher income situations um, because they've been somehow touched by meritocracy or what have you seen? Yeah, I mean, certainly I think it's a mixed bag, right? There's folks I know who have been able to kind of move or transcend from one class position to another through through education primarily. Um, but the reality is, you know, for many folks, I know kind of the, the position you're born into, the neighborhood, and, and especially, you know, one thing we're going to talk about is social capital, right? The social capital that your parents have or your family has played tremendous roles in their success. Not to say people I know who, who are successful didn't work hard, that wasn't part of it, but simply the fact that you have a middle class background, like myself was born into, you know, a pretty standard Canadian middle class family. Mom was an immigrant from the Caribbean. My dad was born here, but both of them had graduate degrees. Both of them had a real understanding of how the Canadian system worked, how government worked, how the educational system worked, how to navigate it. And that was a tremendous part in removing some of the barriers that could have been there for my success. And I see that 
with so many folks. Um, now, other ones have, have achieved success, but when you look at their families, in many cases, there is this trade-off, right? Folks come to this country, newcomers with all kinds of skill, with all kinds of merit, but except it simply won't be um, accepted in Canada. It won't be seen at the same level and they will not be able to achieve up to their ability and they pour all of their time and resources into their children. I don't think there's anything wrong with parents sacrificing for their kids, but a society where you know from the default, my degree won't be respected. I won't be respected because of the accent I have other pieces. Um, that That's not a true meritocracy. That's not an even playing field. And that's a critical piece that we need to think about because we have so many folks here with incredible potential to give to society who are held back in many ways because of a lack of Canadian experience. Hmm. And as someone said, if you're a doctor and you are healing people in Egypt, bodies are, you know, human beings are still human beings in Egypt hmm. as they are here. And yet for some reason that merit is no longer accepted in our system. Well, a lot of what we're talking about here today is about being listened to and about being respected. And to that end, we got a note, you know, we get mail every day, emails every day, mostly from uh, from viewers uh, who want to give us a piece of their mind and we're happy to have it. And a couple of months ago, we got an email from a viewer, just goes by the name of Walter, about uh, our choice of guests on one program. And I'm going to get Tony Burke to bring this up and I'll read along with it here. I feel Mr. Pakin's choice of guests who are experts in their fields for the particular topics on the agenda is pretty good, but they seem to miss the point. Oh, they sound well enough with all their jargon, but do not strike me as ones who walk the walk. They discuss their point from their studies and research, but do not express the word from the street of the average Joe and Josephine, because in effect, Joe and Josephine are not so average and have very interesting thoughts and viewpoints to offer. It would be most interesting, Walter says, I think, if the agenda program also brought in not only professors, economic experts, etc., but also people who are slugging away in their jobs to make ends meet. Uh, a bunch of things to unpack there. And first of all, for clarification's sake, uh, one of the things I definitely need to do off the top is confirm, Pakin doesn't choose the guests. <laughs> the producers choose the guests. I'm not ducking responsibility by saying that, but I just think viewers ought to know that's how it works on our programs. The producers choose the guests. Second and most important, what Walter wants is people like him, I guess, to be visible and to be heard. Uh, Janice, there's a bit of a shot in there, I think, about people like you, people who have great credentials and who have spent a life in academia. And I want to better understand what you think this tells you about the attitude towards, if I can put it this way, the credential classes. Yeah, I, I think um, Walter is giving voice uh, to a really important point, how he feels uh, and the feeling that he has that, you know, the credential classes, me, um, don't speak like they do. And But more important than the way we speak is we don't hear them. And underneath that is we don't respect them. And if I had to pick one issue that drives populism, it's that. It's the feeling of, you know, it's that famous line from Hillary Clinton that probably going on in history. They are a bunch of deplorables. She gave voice to that sense of disrespect and condescension that is so corrosive uh, of any sense of community. So, and, and let me just take Walter's point and take it one step further. Uh, Steve, we're at, the, at a point of intersection now where, wow, those jobs that John talked about, those good paying jobs on the line, they're gone. <laughs> they're not coming back. And more and more of the jobs we're gonna have in the future are gonna require um, some sort of digital literacy and, uh, and you know, a familiarity, but they're not gonna be enough to lift people uh, through that, those porous boundaries between the classes. Really, what does that tell us? That the work you do should not be the basis of the respect that you get. And I think that's at the core of Michael's argument. You can be an artist. <laughs> and, you know, and I'll confess, I love artists. So you can be an artist, never get above that $10,000 one that Kofi just talked about, but make a tremendous contribution to your society. You can be a novelist. There's a whole, you know, you can work with kids. You can be a caregiver. 
uh, for for a senior. All those people are not uh, high earners, and when we use that single criteria, how much money you make is the, the is the one line that determines how much respect you get. We that's the issue with meritocracy that the criteria of merit are too narrow. And it's going to get worse as we move into this next stage of the economy. You know, that, let me just throw it out that next, you know, we are discussing a universal basic income for a reason. We understand that we're going to have large chunks of the population that are not going to find those kinds of good paying jobs. And the simply to tell people how much you earn is the single criteria by which we value you is wrong. Uh, that's perfect because I want to go to John Ibbotson on this on that very point. I, I was thinking of it as you gave your answer, and then you talked about the UBI. And John, uh, you know, if we wanted to produce a program, let's say about universal basic income, you know, we could go to any academic institution in the country and find somebody with thirty years' experience of doing research into welfare systems and so on and so forth. Uh, or we could get somebody who's you know lived on the streets for 30 years and has been a social services recipient and has a very different understanding of what it's like to live on welfare and for whatever reason uh, our industry seems to prize the former and not so much the latter and i want to know what we can do about that yeah well of course there is a skill involved uh in spending half an hour being grilled by stephen Payton. Um, and uh, a person, who, uh, the, uh, the Joe and Josephine, as the writer said, um, probably doesn't uh, yet possess those skills and would um, not give good television, to be just blunt about it. But I think that misses the point. Uh, the bigger point is the, um, again, the ossification of class structures that we are threatened with by the rise of the knowledge economy. Um, uh, the, the middle class breeding middle class and the working class breeding working class and the knowledge economy, in fact, making class divisions starker rather than more permeable. Um, I wrote a Twitter essay uh, a, a year ago that seems to get continually uh, republished in which I talked about how do you become a columnist. And I my first piece of advice was work night cops. Uh, that's how I started my generation. They, they put you on the night beat uh, and you worked, um, uh, you saw pretty much the seamiest possible side of the city that you were covering. Um, uh, I also worked for years as a secretary. And as I said, uh, you know, if you want to uh, tell people how you, they sh how government should be spending their taxes, work with them uh, rather than talking at them. So I would put this as a challenge to anyone who is watching this show who is young. If you have structured your life such that you're planning to go from university to maybe graduate work or maybe um, into the workforce in the area that you wish to, to work in. Um, now, look, you may, in fact, be worried mostly about the fact that you're going to have nothing but contract positions for the rest of your life. That, but that's another topic. The, other, the question you should be asking yourself is, what am I doing as an individual to experience all of the elements of my society? Should I be taking two or three years off uh, to travel? Uh, should I be taking two or three years off uh, to go work for an NGO? Should I be taking two or three years off to go work as a truck driver? What am I doing to make sure that I don't always inhabit the class bubble that I was raised in? What am I doing to make sure that I can honestly understand the experiences, um, and opportunities and frustrations of the people living outside my class? That really is not something government can do. Uh, that's only something we can we can inculcate in ourselves and in others by saying, get out from your gated suburban community and go live in the real world, world for a while. You'll be the better for it. That is a great challenge, and I hope people take you up on that. Uh, let's get Michael Sandel back in here because I want to get political for a second. Tony, if you would, let's roll that second Sandel clip. We should shift the whole focus of our politics away from the rhetoric of rising, away from thinking that the solution to inequality is to promise individual upward mobility through higher education. We should focus less on arming people for meritocratic combat and focus more on making life better for people who make valuable contributions 
through the work they do, the families they raise, the communities they serve, even though they may not have the lustrous credentials that a meritocratic society so prizes. And the way I would do this, the way I think we should shift the terms of public discourse, Steve, is to put the dignity of work rather than individual upward mobility, the dignity of work right at the center of our politics. Let's figure out how we're going to do that. Kofi, let me get you on this first. We'll go back to 2016. Two thirds of white Americans without a college degree voted for Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton, conversely, won more than 70% of the voters with advanced degrees. I, I, I hope this is not a controversial thing to say, but it, despite the fact that Donald Trump is a thoroughly disgraceful person, he clearly was a voice for a part of America which felt ignored. Do we need a shift of the sort that Michael Sandel is talking about to avoid more Trumps, if I can put it that way? Yeah, I, I think we need a shift in a few ways. It's not just the discourse, but when I think about the dignity of work, I think about decent work. And that's something that has to do not just with how we talk about it and speak about it, but how we structure our economy, right? And that's one of the worrying things that happened in Ontario is, you know, we had labor laws which hadn't been reviewed for, for decades. We had some critical pieces put in place around people having consistent scheduling, right? Folks who are working in multiple locations, like those PSWs jumping around locations, that they could know consistently when they were working, that they could have paid sick days, that we could have a livable minimum wage. And many of those things were rolled back as soon as you know we had a change of government. And I think we need to actually go deeper and say, what does decent work mean? What are some of the basics that all workers in our economy deserve so that they can be respected, so that they can look after their families, so that they know they can save for retirement, that they can have a vacation a year, some of these basic pieces that are part of fully enjoying modern life in Canada. And we need to enshrine that in what we do. We also need leaders. Um, to what John was saying, I agree. That's, it's about that personal connection. That's a big part of it. Um, when I was working in Jane and Finch, running a charity there, people would say all the time about Rob and Doug Ford. They said, these guys come to the hood. We see them. They come, they talk to us. And they, they said to me, Kofi, the critical thing is they don't seem uncomfortable when they walk into a Toronto community housing building. They don't seem uncomfortable in a room full of working class folks. Now, I think one of the problems, I'm a political progressive, and one of, I think, the problems with the progressive movement and things to build on is the way in which through the language we use and the discourse, we get so into our echo chambers, talking to each other, connecting to each other, forming relationships in the part of the city we live in. And in order to really transform society, at the heart is human connections between people. And so especially for those in the political classes, those who are in you know, the managerial professional class, that need for connection to other neighborhoods, other communities is key, but we're moving the opposite direction. You used to see one of the biggest ways you would connect folks across class divides was through marriage. More and more we have doctors marry doctors, PhD marry PhDs. We become not just separate around educational lines, but we create separate cultures. And then political alignments, views, the type of TV you watch, all of these pieces now become so thoroughly lined up around these different polarized tribes that it's very easy for an opportunistic political actor to come in, see that cleavage, and turn it into a populist movement or use that as a campaign. And we break that down through building human relationships across those class divides. Janice, we've literally got just a couple of minutes left here, but let me let me suggest to you that, that maybe Rob Ford and Doug Ford were not exactly your kind of politicians. And I'm gonna go out on a very short limb here and say, I'm betting you didn't vote for either one of those guys. But having said that, they tapped into something that made people who felt like they were ignored important and oh, yeah. you have to give them that in a democracy i you, you know i had a conversation with one of our best known progressives uh, in the city when doug ford was elected and the comment he made to me was oh my god we don't do this and i said just a minute just a minute who's the we here right half the city voted for this mayor so let's not make this assumption. You mean people like you don't do that. And that's exactly the divide that Kofi was talking about. But you know, Steve and, and, and John said it's not about government, but it is about government to some degree. Look, every single one of us knows what's ha what happened in long-term care homes in this province over the last 15 months. 
part of that is we had peace, you know, personal support workers who were doing shift work and were working in multiple institutions because they did not make a decent living. What have we done about it? You know, a, a, a window of 90,000 for permanent residency in this country was opened by the government. We have, there are hundreds of thousands of personal support workers who can't make a decent living and who are waiting forever to get their permanent residency in this country. That's about government and that's frankly not okay. And you don't need any highfalutin dialogue to say it. It's just not okay. People who are working in Brampton, in meat processing factories, couldn't get sick leave. This is in part about government and what we learned from what we saw over this last 15 months. It stripped off, you know, any band aid that we had. And if we go, we, I, I guess what I'm really saying, Steve, is there's no going back to what was. If we don't go forward to something better, given what we've seen, it is really, really disappointing. As she often does when she and I speak, Janice Stein gets the last word. I want to thank John Ibbotson from the Globe and Mail, Janice Stein from the University of Toronto, Kofi Hope from the Toronto Star for coming onto our program tonight for a great conversation on our democracy agenda. Thanks so much. Thanks, Pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having Thanks. me. And we'll have another episode of our joint TVO Toronto Star Initiative, The Democracy Agenda, in two weeks' time. And as part of this series, you can also look at my column on this subject in today's newspaper. And that is the agenda for Thursday, May 27th, 2021. As more than half of Ontarians have had their first dose of vaccine, tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka will find out about when to expect those critical second doses. Also, we'll hear from Calgary's outgoing mayor, Nahid Nenshi, on why he's not seeking another term. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.